thank you for uh, inviting me and thank you very much for coming everyone. I am going to talk about everyone's favorite topic. When will the robot come and take your job? Or more broadly, I'm going to talk about automation more than robots in particular. And I'm going to try and understand how has automation in the past affected job growth in different occupations. And then hopefully once we've talked about that, I'm going to sort of try and have a view of what's going to happen over the next, say, 5, 10, or 20 years. Now, I intend to talk for around 45 minutes and then take Q&A from the audience. And then we can sort of try and have a conversation where I can learn something and you can learn something. I should be upfront and say I am primarily going to show data from Europe and the United States. And I do that for three reasons. I hope we can bring in other parts of the world as we talk afterwards. I'm going to do that for three reasons. One is that those are the regions I know the best. I've lived and worked in both the United States and several countries in Europe. Second, those are the countries where we have the best data and where things have been the most stable. So if I were to ask the question, what has been the effect of automation in Abu Dhabi over the last 30 years? I mean, like automation has happened, but everything else in Abu Dhabi has happened over the same period of time. It's difficult to ask those type of questions in countries that change a lot, Abu Dhabi, China, and so on. So I will generally focus on Europe and the United States. And third, I think these things are most important in those countries. So think about what automation is. Automation is figuring out how to replace labor with an algorithm or a computer or a robot or something like that. Now, when you want to do that, you want to do that when labor is expensive. Think about Switzerland. A worker might cost $25 an hour in Switzerland. A worker might cost $1 an hour in India. You have a higher incentive to replace or automate the worker in Switzerland. And we expect these things to happen the first in those type of countries. So that's why I'm going to be talking about those countries. Now, that also means if automation is fundamentally about replacing labor, then we should look back and see that is a big chunk of what technology is. Technology has been doing that for centuries, if not millennia. You could argue that a horse is replacing a worker with a very primitive form of technology. It has certainly been going on ever since the Industrial Revolution. So I could have alternatively phrased this question of saying, why are there still any jobs? How can it be that we've had so much automation and technological progress over the past 200 years and we still have jobs? The unemployment rate hasn't gone up over this period. It's still, say, 5% in the US, 5% in Germany. The unemployment rate is not ticking up, even though we've had all of this technological change over this period. So um, even though that's been the case, people have worried about technological change and automation for as long as we've done it. So these are the Luddites from the 19th century. They were also called the machine bashers. And the reason they were called the machine bashers is that they were workers who'd lost a job to very early technology in the 1840s in the UK. They would sneak into the factories at night and smash up the machines in the hope of getting their job back. So that was a big problem in the 1840s in the United Kingdom. So what do you do as a policymaker when facing that? Do you provide unemployment benefits? Do you try to retrain workers? Do you try to smooth the transition? No, you don't. You find all of them, send half of them to Australia, and execute the other half of them. <laughs> and that solved the problem. So for a while, we didn't have the Luddites anymore. This pops up every now and then. This is an article from Time magazine in 1961. And it starts with an interesting premise. It says, well, technology does two things. It takes away jobs, but it also creates new jobs. And up until 1961, we'd seen that those two had sort of been nice balance. And then the premise of this article is that we're worried that the job generating part of technology is slowing down, while the job destroying part of technology is speeding up. Sounds familiar with what we're talking about right now. They were talking about that 60 years ago as well. This is a very important book from 1995. It makes very many predictions by Jeremy Rifkin, a prominent economist. One of the predictions it makes is that the unemployment rate in 2010 will be more than 20%. That didn't happen. We didn't have any long-term trend in unemployment upwards. We had a, a, a rise during the financial crisis, but it's come down since. Uh, you've probably seen a version of this figure. This is from The Economist, but this, a figure like this went all over the newspapers everywhere 
for uh, a couple of years ago. So it basically says, what is the automation risk by various different jobs? We have sort of food preparation, construction, and cleaning, and so on in the very top. High automation risk. And then down here, we have teaching. It's crossed. Hopefully, there's little of an automation risk of that. So we see these things again and again and again. So I'm going to try and understand what's been going on for the last 30 or 40 years. And I'm going to build a little framework to think about that. And I'm going to use that framework to talk about how things might be different in the years to come. Think about a dichotomy of the falling type. I'm going to argue that computers, the introduction of modern computers over the last 40 years, is one of the primary drivers in the economy. Now we have things that are version of computers, but AI, artificial intelligence. So I'm going to try and talk about what's the difference between those two. And if we're at the cross by AI, how might things look different over the next some years. So I'm just going to sort of take as a starting point these factors. One, income in, uh, uh, unemployment has not been trending upwards, even though we've had all of this automation. So just 100 years ago, in a country like Denmark, where I'm from, 80% of people worked in agriculture. Then over the last 100 years, women joined the workforce. No one works in agriculture anymore. And we still have an unemployment rate of 4.5. So that's something we have to understand. However, income inequality, especially over the last 40 years, has been growing in almost all Western countries. So that's sort of what we want to what we want to point out. So that picture is much less clear in developing economies. By some measures, income inequality is going down in Mexico. It depends a lot on how you cut it. It doesn't depend on how you cut it in the developed world. Their income inequality has generally been trending up. And then we want to contrast past automation with future automation. So I'm going to start out by showing some facts. And then I'm going to interpret those facts in the light of what I'm saying here. I'm going to start out with this figure. So let's take the left first. This is the US. A common measure of income inequality is the so-called Gini coefficient. Gini coefficient of zero means no income inequality at all. Everyone has exactly the same. Gini coefficient of one means that one person has everything. And we've seen that's the um, uh, purple here. We've seen that's been trending up since 1964, 65 in the US. An alternative measure is take the 90th percentile of the income distribution meaning the person making the least in the top 10%, take the 10th percentile of the income distribution, meaning the person who makes the most amongst the lowest 10%, and do a ratio of those two. That is, we ignore the Zuckerbergs and the Angelina Jolies, and we ignore the unemployed, and then we see what happens with sort of regular people. And we see basically the same trend. Income inequality growing from 1965 upwards in the US. Now, the 90-10 thing I've done on the right as well, but for various European countries. So this is the increase in the United States. This 0.6 means that the percentage growth for people in the high end has been 60% percentage points higher than the percentage growth in income for people in the low end. A substantial difference. The blue ones are 1990 to 2008. And we see it's a general trend in many different countries, France being a notable exception, that income inequality along this measure has gone up. So we have this fact that in many countries that look different but are all sort of economically wealthy, income inequality tends to go up. If we disentangle that and we look at for whom or what is driving this, we get a picture that looks like this. So this is the US again, but I could show you similar figures in other European, in European countries. What I've done here is I've said, go back to 1963 and normalize all wages to 100, meaning I can read the increase in the wage on this axis, and then do real wages, meaning I'm correcting for inflation. And then I'm going to look at different educational attainments. So I'm going to say uh, high school dropout, no high school degree, high school graduate, all the way up to a graduate degree. Those are the INSAD MBAs with a graduate degree. You see a dramatic difference. For people down in the bottom of the educational distribution, you can argue that they haven't even seen a real wage increase over the past 50 years. The real wage that these people are getting is only marginally higher than what it was 50 years ago. And there's been a dramatic increase for income for the higher end of the educational distribution. This is even more puzzling in the light that there are more, many, many more of these now. So we had at the same time, the price of educated people has gone up. 
as the supply of educated people has gone up as well. Economists don't like that, right? Price going up should mean, uh, quantity going up meaning that should mean the price goes down. So something has clearly happened in the economy that favors educated people. And I'm going to argue that that thing is computers. Now, uh, I split men and women in here into two. I'm going to do that every now and then. And the reason is twofold. On the one hand, women in the US joined the workforce since the 60s and up until now. So if I want to have a consistent population, I ought to look at people who also worked 60 years ago, and that's men. So that's sort of keeping labor force participation constant, if you will. Second, we're going to show later on that the new jobs that are being created in the economy dramatically differ across men and women. And then I'm going to show that again. There's quite a distinct difference between the two. So every now and then, the separation between men and women will pop up. Now, um, I need to do the following, because I need to talk about what do computers do, and what do people do, and who do computers replace. That means I need to ask two questions. I need to ask specifically what do people do, and what do computers do. So I'm going to start out with what do people do. So take me. I'm a university professor. So I show up at the office. I do some reading, both scholarly journals, newspapers, and so on. I use Google to find these things. Then a couple of hours later, I prepare for a class. I do that using a computer. Again, I look for data and information and so on online. Then I might take a nap. I am an academic after all. That's one of the benefits. And then I teach in the afternoon using tools around this type, sort of with a presenter and a projector and so on and so forth. So technology has had some influence on me. It's mostly positive. Not dramatic. It's actually not that different from what it was 50 years ago. But notice what I've done. I thought about a job as a series of tasks, different things that you do during the day. All jobs are a combination of different tasks, specific things that you do. I do research. I prepare a class. I talk to the press. I give a, cl a class, and so on and so forth. So the cool thing about this, or the neat thing about this, is that statistical agencies spend a lot of effort figuring out what all sorts of different occupations are. So the American Statistical Agency, the German, and the Danish, and the French, and so on, have gone out and collected for 800 different occupations. What is it that people sit and do all day, and tabulated which one of these tasks is the most important one? So I'm going to use the US one here, just because that's in English. I could have done the equivalent for many other countries. And I get something like this. So here I've gone back to. 1990, and I've taken three occupations, not randomly selected, as will be the case in just a case, in second. And then I've just listed the four or six most important tasks that each one of these occupations did 30 years ago. So we start out with the surgeon. What does a surgeon do? Well, he does the surgeries. That's primarily what he does. He also has to examine and communicate with the patient. He has to examine the patient medical history. And he has to conduct research in trying to make uh, the uh, approaches that we use better. So those are his primary tasks. Let's take a secretary. What did a secretary do 30 years ago? Well, she answers, he answered the phone. He maintained the calendar. He created, and look, this is in the 1990s. So we have create, maintain, electronic, or paper filing systems, right? Crazy paper filing systems. Type letters book traveling, and so on and so forth. And then on the third, we have a gardener who prunes the trees, cuts the grass, and so on and so forth. Now, why have I brought these up? Now, think about the surgeon. What has technology done for him? Well, it's improved some of his tasks, right? The internet makes it easier for him to look up what other surgeons are doing, it makes it easier for him to do research in improving. It makes it easier for him to look up the medical history of his patient, and so on. But so it's done some of the things, but it hasn't dramatically changed his job. It's complementing him a bit. Then we have the secretary. All of the things the secretary used to do are now much easier done with some form of communication or technology. So think about book traveling. Kayak does that for you now. They never type up letters anymore. We all have our own word processor. Maintain calendar. We do that with Google Calendar. Electronic filing system, all of these things have been shrunk by technology. That's what a computer can do. And then on the right, I've chosen something 
That is exactly now the way that it was 40 years ago. A gardener does very little different now than he did back then. So formally, what I have in mind is the following. I want to say each job consists of a series of tasks. They're all essential, right? So I cannot teach my class unless I've prepared my class. That's a different task. I cannot prepare my class unless I've done my research and I know what I'm talking about. So all of these tasks are essential. So that is a job back in, say, 1980. Then think about what a computer does. We need to think about a computer as replacing some of these tasks. So there's some of the things I would have had to do as a professor 40 years ago, say, go down to the library and look for a book that Google does for me now. But it's very little of my overall tasks that computers are doing automatically. Think about the secretary instead. A lot of her tasks have been replaced. So if only some of your tasks are replaced, it actually makes you more productive. I can do research faster now that I don't have to run down to the library. But if too many of your tasks are, are um, replaced, then you become redundant. So there's sort of a nice middle point in between the two. Too much replacement of your tasks, redundancy. A little replacement of your task, complementarity. So that's how I want us to think about what people do as a selection of tasks where some of these tasks are more easily replaceable or automatable than others. Let's think about which one would be automatable. I'm going to do that with the following insights into computers. What computers do is they perform routine codifiable tasks that are fully understood. Now, what do I mean about that? I mean computers cannot do very high level of adaptability, creativity, flexibility, or common sense. Now, two words here are central. Routine and fully understood. Routine is not something in the sense of something that's easy for you and I to do. It's something that's easy for us to explain a computer how to do. This is often articulated as Polanyi's paradox, which is that there is a ton of things we know how to do, but which we can't write down. You might know how to ride a bike. You cannot write a book that will teach someone else how to ride a bike. They have to go and try it themselves. You might know how to do addition. You can write a book that will teach someone else how to do addition. The two sort of canonical examples is this is easy to explain to a computer in the sense that programmers can do it. I mean, I couldn't explain a computer how to do that, but I understand what's going on here. You take the zeros and you add them, you take the zeros and you add them, you take the zeros and you take the two and the four. We understand exactly what it is that we're doing here. It's also easy for us to recognize that that's a cat. But, but why? It's just a collection of little pixels. It's very difficult to articulate to a computer what is a picture of a cat, even though it's routine for you and I to recognize a picture of a cat. That's why often when you sign into a website and it asks you whether you're a person, you click the little thing and it gives you something like, which one of these seven pictures is a storefront, then you have to choose which one of them is because computers are very bad at doing that. There's a ton of things we know how to do, but which we can't articulate. Those things we can articulate, I'm going to call them routine in the sense that we can teach a computer how to do it. I'm going to use this to create a matrix. And I'm going to create a matrix in which I think of jobs in a two-dimensional space. On the one hand, there's routine and non-routine. And by that, I mean, can you easily explain to a computer what to do? So, and then I've chosen manual and non-manual occupations. So let's start with manual routine occupations. That's going to be the assembly work that we had 60 years ago. That's just going to be take object A, put it on plate B, and wait for object C to come and take it away. That's very easy to describe. That's exactly what you're doing. But describing what a truck driver does in detail is difficult. That's why we still don't really have self-driving cars. We have something assembling it, uh, approaching it. But we haven't fully understood how to describe that, because there's a lot of intuitive stuff going on in that sense. The gardener is going to be here as well. And then I've taken the cognitive approaches. So I've said cognitive, routine, particularly the secretary. So a lot of routine stuff. We can describe to a computer exactly what it means to, fly, to find the cheapest flight from Copenhagen 
to Abu Dhabi. That is what Kayak is doing. It's perfectly describable. And then there are more non-routine things. You guys are all hoping to become CEOs. We cannot yet describe to a computer what a CEO does. It requires a lot of adaptability and so on. Um, I've somewhat provocatively put an accountant up there. Is anyone here an accountant? <laughs> so it obviously depends on what type of accountant you are. My grandfather in the 40s worked as an accountant in a local bank. And what his job was, was whenever someone came with money and put it in the bank, he would literally take a physical book and say, you have 42 in your account. Here's an additional 16. I'm going to physically add those two things up. And now you have 58. Those things no longer exist. So the accountants that now exist are the creative accountants. We, we call them tax accountants, <laughs> who understand how to operate things more and above just counting. right? So those are the, the, the creative accountants are going to be down here, and the sort of manual accountants, the, um, the routine accountants are going to be uh, up here. And then we're going to have sort of selling, physician, more broader things in the box here. Now note what this means. If we think about automation in terms of two waves, we have that the first wave of automation in the mid 20th century was all of these guys. The easiest thing to automate is a guy who just sits and physically moves one thing to another. And that's what we did from, say, 1940 to 1970. A lot of very basic manufacturing jobs were automated during this time. So very little of this. But then we gradually moved over here to the routine stuff that computers can do and are very good at doing. So that's going to be the second wave of automation, which is going to be towards the end of the 20th century. But notice what that box is, the one in the northeast corner. That's the middle of the income distribution. That's secretaries, mid-level accountants, and so on and so forth. So if I go and look at the educational distribution over these last uh, slightly less than 40 years, I find what we call job polarization. Let me explain what the figure on the left is. If I go back to 1980, and I rank occupations according to how much they make. And then I split them into thirds. So I get the cleaning person to the left in the first. I get the secretary and the mid-level accountant in the middle. And then I get the doctors and the CEOs and so on to the right. And then I looked at what happened to all of these occupations going from 1980 and onwards. And I do that for all of the different European countries. And we see the same pattern. The middle income distribution has, people in the middle occupations have dramatically reduced. And it's the one in the bottom and the top that have gone up. So we've seen job polarization. The jobs in the middle are disappearing. Those are the ones that have been the easiest to replace over these last, say, 40 years. This here shows the wages. And let me not like, get into the details. What it basically says is that in the, this is only for the US is from 70 to 90, uh, I had an even increase in income inequality, meaning the ones with the lowest income saw the lowest increases. But then in the period from 1988 up until 2008, I saw the same pattern, wage polarization, meaning the ones in the middle saw the lowest increases, and the ones in the bottom and the top saw the highest increases. So our measure of income inequality has to be expanded. Income inequality in the bottom, meaning in the bottom 50% of the income distribution, has gone down. The lowest ones are catching up to the ones in the middle. And income distribution in the top has gone up, meaning the ones in the top are running away from the middle. And that has a, that, the, I would argue that, that has a lot to do with those are exactly the jobs that computers were able to automate over these past years. So that's going to be the first basis of my argument. But I'm not really done, right? Because I've talked about how computerization affects different occupations differently. But I haven't talked about why are there still so many jobs? Why haven't we seen much higher income inequality? How do, do these jobs interact with one another? I need to tie that in. I'm going to do that in what I call the ABC of automation. Or more specifically, the CBA of automation. So I'm going to start out with complementarity. And that's going to be what I just talked about. If 
your tasks are such that you benefit from automation, that's the physician, I'm going to call you complementary to automation or new technology, as opposed to a substitutable, which is going to be the secretary. So that's going to be the first concept. Some occupations are complementary, some occupations are substitutable. So that's the secretary versus the physician. But then I'm going to talk about the boost from technology as well. There's going to be two categories here. So the classical one is the one we always talk about, and that's the one the Time Magazine article talked about, which is that technology creates new jobs. We didn't used to have drone flyers because we didn't have drones. Now we have drones, and therefore we have drone flyers. That's sort of the immediate one that everyone thinks about. But there's a subtle additional one that's just as important, which is the following. Think about a factory with a thousand workers. Then the factory owner figures out a way of replacing 800 of those workers. Now he only does that if it makes sense economically, meaning he's going to reduce costs from getting rid of 800 workers. That means one of two things. Either he will therefore reduce prices and consumers benefit, or he will make a higher profit. But in either case, someone increased their wealth. Because that's what technology does. It allows us as a society to become wealthier. So technology both creates direct jobs, but it also creates additional wealth that creates, increases demand for additional jobs. Think about yoga instructors. In the 40s, there were no yoga instructors because no one was wealthy enough to go and do yoga in a studio. But since that, the demand for yoga instructors has increased dramatically because we're all much wealthier than we were in the 1940s. Talk to your grandmother, right? She's always a penny pusher and very careful about what she spends her money on because she lived in a time in which everyone was much poorer. Now what about the yoga instructor? Are yoga instructors super wealthy? Not really, because we, we're lacking the last one. The A, adjustments to labor supply. Different occupations have different ease of coming into. So if there really were only 20 yoga instructors in uh, New York and demand for yoga instructors went up dramatically, they would all be making a fortune. However, it's relatively easy to shift into being a yoga instructor. So we don't see a price effect, we see a quantity effect. There are 10,000 yoga instructors in New York. In other occupations, that's much less the case. It's much more difficult transitioning into becoming a physician because it requires 10 years of medical school and there are restrictions on how many physicians we, uh, we educate in most countries. So that's going to be the last element of it. How complementary or substitutable are you to automation? How much does the general increase in welfare boost the demand for your services? And three, how easy is it to come into your industry and take over? So if we go back here, a lot of these people who lost their job in the bottom would have transitioned down. If you're 45 years old and you lose your job as a mid-level accountant, you're more likely to have to work in a fast food restaurant than to become a physician in the second half of your life. But those are short-term adjustments. It's a matter of whether you can adjust from one occupation to another. So um, I've already talked about this. This one's sort of clear. So let me talk a little bit about this boost from higher income. And I'm going to do that by splitting these jobs into two. So I'm going to talk about frontier jobs, which are the ones that are literally created by new technology. That's going to be the drone driver. And then there I'm going to talk about wealth jobs, which are things we could in principle have done for many years, but where demand has gone up because society is wealthier. That's the yoga instructor. So I, I pulled up uh, from a website uh, a couple of days ago here in, uh, in Abu Dhabi and Dubai examples of different ones of these jobs. So on the left, we have a swarm drone expert. And so, so this sounds very high, right? But this seems like a non-grammatical sentence. Uncertainty swarm robotics and or human robot interaction. I don't know what this uncertainty is doing, but it's definitely a, a job posting for a high tech new job that didn't exist a few years ago. We have mechanics and robots, and then obviously the artificial engineering uh, here. And then we have indirectly the wealth jobs. Those are going to be a, not just a barista, but a maestro barista making the best coffee. Going to have the spa therapists. This one is required to be uh, female. And then we're going to have sommeliers. 
So souvenirs, the, the wine experts in restaurants, uh, didn't exist as a separate occupational category in, say, the US statistical agencies, because there were like 120 of them in all the United States in 1950. Now there are so many that they've actually created a new category of these things such that we count what some years are actually doing. So I'm going to do, uh, let me actually just skip this. So I'm going to define these jobs, namely all the ones that have popped up reasonably as, as, a, as an actual size, and I'm going to split them into whether they've started to be important because of wealth or because of technology. And I'm going to cut down and see what are the characteristics of these jobs. So this is what I get. So this is for the US because some of these data are easier to get in the US. But I could have done similar things in Western Europe. So one, this is going to be the average wage for all jobs, which is just south of $20 in the United States. Then you have the frontier jobs, new technology jobs, which have substantially higher wages. You have the wealth work, which does not has wages at the same level. The spar, the person at the spar, is not making more than the average economy. Percent women, and this is where I'm going to flag the second important thing about men and women I'm going to say. For the frontier jobs, it's 28. For the wealth jobs, it's going to be 62. Uh, these require more college, not much of a difference in high school. And then, so these are still relatively small in terms of occupational distribution, almost by design, because I've chosen the occupations that didn't exist a few years ago, but they're growing fast, and they're growing fast in particular in the cities. Let's do a few examples of what these are. Let's actually just do like this. So uh, these are going to be the teachers. These are going to be the nurses. These are going to be a lot having to do with health. These are going to be many of these types of occupation. So um, let me take stock here and just sort of recap what I've said so far before we start talking about AI. The way I want you to think about it is that each job is a set of tasks. Some of these tasks are more routine in the sense that we can tell a computer how to do it. Some are less routine. Some are manual, some are non-manual. The people who are the most complicated by technology, complemented by technology, are the ones in which a few of their tasks are made easier, but they're not completely replaced. So that's the surgeon. The ones who are hurt the most are the ones where many of their tasks are being automated or replaced by some form of a computer. So, and those are the middle income ones. So that's where we've seen the lowest increase in wages, the lowest increase in employment growth. Why overall unemployment has not gone up is because whenever we automate something, we, get, we free up income or wealth and people are going to spend that on something else. So there's been an increase in the demand for occupations that were either non-existent or much smaller some 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. Those are the frontier jobs and the wealth jobs. So the increase in those occupations has been substantial. That's compensating it. Whether you get something out of that in the sense that the wage increases depends on how easy is it for someone else to move into that job versus uh, is there a limited supply of those people. So let me take that framework and talk about AIs. Because we hear about AI all the time. AI is generally defined as opposed to a computer who only does what we tell it to do as some form of a system that can learn by itself. And what I mean by that is I told you that computers can't recognize cats, but they actually kind of can. So what Google did a few years ago is that they gave uh, one of their big computers, five million pictures, of which one million of them were cats, and it didn't tell the computer anything else but that. Then machine learning algorithms figured out what's special about those pictures, and then inferred what is special about a cat picture, and was able to, with some accuracy, predict in the future what pictures, or in this case videos, are about cats and which are not. That is AI. It's letting a computer figure out what's special about cats instead of us telling the computer what's special about cats. Another example is uh, Watson, which beat the Jeopardy master uh, some years ago. And what this basically does is that it roams all over the internet, collects information, 
and then tries to answer the questions, or in Jeopardy it's the other way around, question the answer. Uh, and it actually managed to win, uh, win, the, um, win the competition. That's another example of a computer that learns by itself, AI. Then we obviously have the self-driving cars, which hopefully will make it into a uh, real world within the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years. We keep being promised that it's going to happen soon. And then I'm going to pull this up as well, the Alpha Zero. It's been a while since we taught computers to be chess masters um, uh, electronically. Recently, a few years ago, the game Go, Chinese chess, was also best, the champion was also bested by a computer algorithm. The reason I bring this up is because another program beat that program. And the way they designed this program was the following. We're not going to teach it anything about Go except the very basic rules. How does it work? And then we're going to have two of these algorithms play against each other and learn from the games that they've only played against each other. Never see what humans have ever done. Never try to learn something from humans. We're going to have them do that 40 million times. And by the time they come out for that, they're so good from just playing with one another that they've learned how to beat both the humans and the program that beat the humans a few years ago. So the 40 million time, games is a lot, but you know, I mean, it takes one of these supercomputers like a couple of months to do that, right? <coughs> so these are the things we hear all the time, and the question is, how much will this matter? Because if computers are now breaking out of this routine straight jam, just put them in, then my paradigm might fall apart, and we might see a broader aspect of computer replacement. More things, things I've talked about as being non-routine, might no longer be non-routine because computers can learn by themselves. But hold on, these are quite specific. So Watson was promised, the promise of Watson was not just that it would win Jeopardy, but that we'd use these type of algorithms to detect cancer in skin cancer, various types of uh, radiology, and so on. We're moving in that direction, but we're still not there at all. You still have that it's doctors who have to tell you whether you have cancer or not. With certain types of skin cancers, they're now getting better, but we're far from taking over the, taking over the, um, the doctors. Self-driving cars are far from being able to drive in New Delhi. Has anyone here ever driven in New Delhi? I mean, I can't drive in New Delhi either, but a computer certainly can't. And Alpha Zero needed to play these 40 million games to train itself. So these are surely a matter of time, but this is not moving as fast as some people think. And what I mean by that is that, true, they can train themselves, but they need an incredible amount of data. So AlphaGo can train itself to play Go well if it has 40 million games. Google can figure out what a cat picture is if it has a million pictures of cats. But anything in terms of, say, running a company, it can't simulate an environment 40 million times. So it's still quite limited what AI and technology can do in this sense. Self-driving cars are the same. They can drive in a nice climate in San Francisco when the weather is good and the satellites is helping it. But driving in New Delhi, where everyone else is driving in a chaotic sense, we're quite far away. But let's entertain the notion, even though I'm a little skeptical that these things are going to revolutionize anything right around the corner. Let's entertain the notion. And let's say, what is it that these computers can then do? Well, they might be able to analyze at a higher abstract level. They might be able to make more creative decisions. There's some things they might be able to do. But there's one thing they definitely will not be able to do, and I'm going to wrap up with that, which is social skills. So I'm going to take this from a very clever paper by Deming uh, last year or the year before. So what he did is the following. He said, well, some jo jobs require math abilities, like college degree, you need basic understanding of numeracy, and so on and so forth. Those are sort of the abstract jobs I talked about before. Physician, engineer, accountant, and so on. Some jobs require social skills. It requires the interaction of people, reading the signals of the people, communicating to your team, and so on and so forth. Let's split jobs into four. Low math, low social, high math, high social, and then one of the two. And let's go back to 1980 and see what has been the trend of employment growth in each one of these two. And we see the high social 
and high math are the two top ones, and the low social and uh, at, is down uh, here in the bottom. Now, what does that tell us? One, employment is growing in things that requires social interaction. And not just that, there's a complementarity between high social and high math. So the ones that are really growing are the ones that make you understand both the quantitative abstract part of it, but also the human interaction. So those are the managers, for instance, who understand both aspects of it. So there's a nice complementarity between those two. But social skills seem to be increasingly important. It's going to be a while before we have a computer like the movie Her that really does seem like a person. So my conjecture is over the next five or 10 years, those are going to be increasingly important. Let me just show you a figure I showed before, which is teachers, managers, nurses, health technicians, health therapists, and so on. All of these require social skills. As the population is growing older, more uh, late in life care specialists and so on will be quiet as well. Those are also the ones that require social skills. And then <laughs> the writers, editors, and reporters and so on come down here in the bottom. So I think that's what we will see. Even if computers manage to do these quantitative aspects better, what's really going to be driving things is the social interactions. Salesmen, health specialists, teachers, all of these things. So that's going to be my overall conclusion, which is technology doesn't automatically reduce employment. Actually, historically, it has not at all. The main reason for that is regardless of whether we invent a new job or not, automation frees up income. It makes society wealthier, which means we're going to spend more money. We're either going to spend them more money on jobs that didn't exist before, or we're going to create these jobs because we're wealthier. We're going to have sommeliers. We're going to have yoga instructors. We're going to have all of these jobs. Whether that increases employment or whether that increases wages for the people working in those occupations depends on the adjustment of labor. Is this something you can easily move into? And then I really want to push that in the future, I think more than sort of the non-routine cognitive abilities of physicians and so on, we're going to move into social abilities, salesmanship, and so on being important for both wage growth and uh, employment growth. So I think that's going to be my uh, overall conclusion. Thank you very much for paying attention, or at least appearing to. So out of that, what do you think for companies? Do they have to invest more in technology or in people? Oh, the answer to that is always people. Are you talking about? Are you talking about a specific type of company now? No, generally, uh, companies are all talking we need to invest in tech, in new, uh, you know, new systems, etc. No company is saying we need to invest in people. Yes. So I think uh, what in particular you want to invest in is both people, but you, always, you also want to invest in finding the right people. Because jobs are becoming much less, much less general and much more specific. So you want to find someone who really understands how to leverage both the technology and the relationship they have with other people, and that's becoming increasingly uh, important. So you can't just hire someone who's 22 out of college with a GPA of 3.8. You really need to figure out, is this a person who fits with this institution? Because those things are becoming increasingly important. Yeah? If we go back to the slide where we had wealth employment and the frontier employment. This one? Yeah. Uh, regarding the percentage of women, do you have any interesting ideas about this 28% there, apart from the obvious fact of technology being more kind of close to men? I mean, that's the, that's the big conversation, right? About whether women are less likely to choose these jobs because of some inherent preference or because there's uh, a bias against them in these, um, in these fields. Um, let me take economics as an example, not necessarily because it's a frontier job. In fact, there's been economics professors for 250 years, and few would argue that we are at the frontier. And let's reflect a little bit on the role of women in economics, where I would guess that 25% of professors of economics are women. It's better at the lower level than at the higher level. Uh, what's happening in academia is the so-called leaky pipeline, which means that 40% of the undergrads are women, 35% of the graduate students are women, 30% of the junior professors are women, 
and 15% of the senior professors are women. Uh, there's quite a movement in trying to, so I think this is, this is due to many different things. I think the main reason is historically, we've been very bad at encouraging women to take these type of jobs. And then in the early periods of a career, it's, it often requires a lot of hours, exactly at the time in which many women choose to do uh, different things. There's an interesting paper by uh, Claudia Golden and Larry Katz, both professors at Harvard, where they look at HBS graduates. And they see what happens to these people when they graduate from the, from the MBA. So they're like 27, 28. And they go out and their job prospects and income and occupational distribution and so on looks kind of similar. It looks kind of similar up until 32, 33, 34. And then you see a big difference when women start having children. So I think the only thing for companies to do, and there's some movement in that direction, but not enough, is to try and make these things more flexible, to try and encourage women to stay on board even when they have uh, life decisions, like women, uh, children in the, in, the, in the 30s. So I think flexibility is the crucial thing here more than, uh, more than anything, both in academia and in the workforce. Yeah? And, um, if, you, if you look at the, the history which you pointed out, right, uh, that uh, even though there were big technology breakthroughs in the past, and employment has uh, stayed close to 100% except for, for periods and then structurally weak areas, right? And you're predicting now that uh, with further technology improvement, uh, employment or, or you know, work will, will, will not go away. Does it then not mean that work is actually a constraining factor to, to uh, wealth creation improvement? No, because it's always at the maximum, right? Or at the maximum utilization, so it must be a constraint then. Oh. I mean, the biggest constraint, the biggest limiting factor in any economy is workers, right? So I mean, you know that as running a company. Your biggest limiting constraint, what you're always short on, is talent. You can replicate everything else, right? You can replicate your building, you can replicate your factory, you can do all of that, but it's really difficult finding extra uh, work. Actually, if I look at what companies spend their money on, sort of take the share of total revenue and what it goes to, the average of all companies is around 66% going to labor because that is the most important factor in a country. Although that has actually been trending down recently. So if I look at overall income in an economy, and I go back 20 years, two thirds of that would have gone to labor. That has trended down over the past year and is becoming uh, gradually uh, lower. But labor is still by far, workers are still by far the most, important, um, the most important factor. Let me add a little thing to what you said, which is that I say that there's no reason to expect unemployment to go up because of technology in the near future. I mean, we can talk 30 years down the line, things might look very different, but let's say over the next 10 years. There are a few wrinkles in that argument. Let me show you a few figures that I have here. So, it's a, little, it's a little messy. I've taken it from an interesting paper by Simuglu and Restrepo. So take the United States and look across all the different counties in the United States. Go back 40 years and think about what industries are these counties in. Some of them are going to be making cars. Some of them are going to be making consulting services, so on and so forth. Then look at what happened from 1980 and up until now and where robots were developed. So that is particularly uh, in the car production, but like various industries, just were more prone to robots than others. If I look at the areas that happen to have been in an industry that was more exposed to robots over this period, I see increases in unemployment and decreases in, um, in employment. And I actually see quite a lot of social ills going with that. So the areas that were more hit by robots also have more, say, suicide, opium overuse, uh, disability, and so on. In the overall scheme of things, it's not big. So it's not like you can see that robots have created a lot of unemployment over all the United States, but there are certain areas that are disproportionately hit where you actually do see an effect. You might worry that these things will be bigger in the years to come, but it's not clear that it will be. And it definitely will not create unemployment of 25% within the next 15 years. In, what's there? Yeah?
If the social skills of people became more important in attaining higher wages, would you suggest educational systems to change something? Mm. As how can they educate people? That is a very good question. Um, now I'm talking a little out of my hat. But I've noticed that in particular when I went to primary school and so on, and also when my sister's kids did, um, there was very little emphasis on these type of things. I mean, you have to learn how to read and write and so on, but there was no class that was called like some version of social skills or how do you learn to interact with other people and so on. It was sort of just assumed that you'd figure out those things by yourself. I have noticed that there are more and more young, uh, sort of beginning schools, primary and secondary schools in the US that make a big point out of teaching these type of emotional intelligence and so on early in the curriculum. I am unaware of any evidence that that's the way to do it, but it's an important starting point. And it's great for all of us if 200 schools do that, sort of try and teach emotional intelligence. And you do it in different ways at different <coughs> levels, right? So you can teach five-year-olds these type of things, but then you just have to do it in like toys and metaphors and games and so on. Learn how to manage their own, say, emotions, learn how to interact and connect with, with people. So there is some movement in introducing that early on and we have to wait to see the extent to which that's going to that's going to help it's promising based on this type of uh, these type of results yeah um, you spoke about the things that may or may not change such as employment in the next 10 years yes if you take 20 years let's say for ai robotics to mature and other technologies and the technology impact to sort of set in yeah. academically and or industry wise what are you discussing in terms of the macro trends that will happen um, employment technology, where things are going to go, the gap in the middle, Gini coefficient. What are the notable macro trends that you see or are discussing that may or may not happen or that you foresee happen? In 20 years or in 10 years? Let's say 20 so that the technology settles in. Yes. Um, so I don't see any reason to expect that in 20 years there's going to be dramatic changes in the share of the population that's in the workforce. You do see trends along certain dimensions. So for instance, young men who haven't gone to high school or who dropped out of high school or just have a high school degree in Western countries are finding it more and more difficult to be attached to the workforce. So they used to have a high employment share and now they have a low employment share. Those are not a big part of the overall distribution, but in particular for men in the low end of the educational distribution, you risk their attainment of their, their attachment to the, to the labor force declining. I think that's the most obvious place to be worried about sort of employment. If you ask me about what industries will grow over the coming years due to technology, I mean, that's exactly what academics cannot do, right? Predict what industry will do well and what industry they will not do well. In the longer horizon, say 40 years, then we start talking about other things. Because hopefully in 2100, none of us have to work if we don't want to work, right? But that is considerably further down the line than right now. And then you start talking about things like universal basic income and things like that, right? Um, which we will have to address as a society at some point. Uh, but so far, technological unemployment is a, is a limiting thing in society and will be for a couple of years to go, or like say a decade to go. Yeah? Um, I, I, I am somewhat an accountant, but I also work a lot with uh, CEOs and CFOs on automating the accounting function in their finance department. Yes. And um, the, the specific tendency that you have here in the Middle East, and I, I guess that's in Asia very similar, um, labor in the accounting department is very, very cheap. So you have a very low tendency to replace anyone um, with that cheap labor. Um, my assumption is because you're not digitalizing early enough, you stay behind compared to other countries um, because you're not switching on to the follow-on effects or the follow-on positive effects that, that will come later on once you go into the initial steps. Do you see that somewhere in your, in your research, that some countries move faster than, than other countries? So that's actually very close to the research I do myself. So let's split that into um, three different topics. One is to what extent do the wages of the worker this, that, that you have in the co economy drive the type of innovation that you see? So I have a research project that's quite preliminary where we do the following. So our measure of innovation is going to be patents. In general, in these things, it's kind of difficult to get a really nice measure of what automation means. Because sometimes automation is computers, 
Sometimes automation is a robot. Sometimes automation is Microsoft Word and so on. So what we do here is that we take all patents ever used. So those are long text codes. And then we use machine learning. So we're using the robots against the robots to read all of these patents and then classify them according to whether this is a patent that automates, say, a new assembly line or something like that, or whether this is a patent that creates a new product but doesn't automate, say, a new form of insulin. And then we ask the question, what leads firms to patent one of those compared with another? And what we really strongly see is that the higher are the wages of people in the middle or the bottom of the income distribution, the more you do this type of uh, innovation automation, and the higher are the wages in the top, the less you do it. Presumably because when you automate, you don't actually replace a low-skilled worker or a cheap worker with a machine. You replace him or her with a combination of a machine and a high-skilled worker, right? You need the engineer or the, or the top manager or something like that to, to run the machine and use the machine. So that definitely we see in the data, that the lower the wages, the less of an incentive you have to do this. That means that you sort of get a trade-off in the economy as a whole. Because on the one hand, you'd like to see wages in the bottom grow. But the more the wages in the bottom grow, the more you're going to have an incentive to automate them. So there's sort of a trade-off, a racehorse between those two. I'm trying to do some work of seeing which one of these is the strongest, but that's still uh, preliminary. Then you ask an additional question about the spillover effects of these type of things. So if I do automation just because I want to save on this particular person, am I then gaining additional things afterwards, or am the people around me, other firms, seeing what I do and learn something as well? We don't know that yet. That's the next topic. Preliminary evidence seems to suggest that that's true. You gain more than just uh, the automation. Uh, but that's not surely. That's, that's a, a, also something I'm working on. Any more questions? All right, well, a big round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>